morning, everybody. Welcome to February's version of Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. What is happening? <laughs> what is happening? I am the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore, and I'm in a great mood today. Great mood. Because we're landing on Mars? Because we're landing on Mars today again with a roving laboratory perseverance rover will be there today at around 4 p.m eastern what do you time mean we commoner <laughs> i follow space exploration very closely no and, that's and, cool i'm just i don't know why it would put you it's like it's such a jovial uh, mood well, well when like when the coolest game around comes out aren't you in a jovial mood Same yeah because it's mine and i own it no, but just the announcement of like the next unbelievable thing makes you great. The announcement no, that, that, that landing on Mars, anymore. I am excited, guys. That's I'm gonna cool. be there. I might even live stream a, like a reaction video. I'm gonna <clears> figure <throat> out if I can do that. It's not usually my thing, but are they streaming something from there? What's going on? Oh well, NASA's gonna be streaming. Yeah, and well, wow. they can't stream the video as of the landing since it's 18 minutes. So the funny thing is well, that they it can actually still stream and with an 18 minute delay, kind of like we do. Well, they. They will be doing a lot of stuff. They'll well, Mike just pointed out that there's one day only Mars donuts at Krispy Kreme today. That is true. <laughs> huh. Special special Mars Next donuts. Next time, today. lead with that. Don't bury the lead. I was right? going to say, now I'm excited. See? <laughs> <laughs> red with like crumb or something. Just like delicious. But, oh, oh, my goodness. Things you've ever seen. But, oh, yeah, that's. Now, yeah. That's, that's tying it back to breakfast. You see? Go back. Oh, oh, you know, that's right. They. There you go, Z. You got the full circle. Anyway, I think this is a board gaming show, not a Mars show, but yeah. But I'm thinking about donuts. So, <laughs> all righty. Anyhow, welcome, folks. We talk about board games on this show for the most part. Lots of cool, interesting things to talk about in the news, and we'll also have um, a game show between Z and Steven. So that's all coming up. But first. Let's listen to these messages, not from our sponsors, but from our contributors. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. We're Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about Forbidden Sky. This is the, a cooperative game in the line of Forbidden Games from uh, Game Right and Matt Leacock. This one features you know, the spaceship that's taking off. You're connecting all these different wires and circuits, uh, trying to get this thing to light up and, you know... And make noise. <laughs> okay, so when this game came out, I was like super excited about it and I I just really liked it and it was my favorite in the series and I thought it was so cool and then I haven't played it since. But I have played the other ones in the series and I haven't touched this one before. It's just been sitting on our shelves for like, what, two years? Yeah. Forever, just sitting there. And I'm like, this game is my favorite. It's obviously not my favorite if I never play it. And if people are like, hey, you want to play a Forbidden? And I'm like, yeah, no, Sky. Yeah. Not my favorite. I think that there's just a gimmick to it, you know, with all the lights and the sounds. And, and there's a high toy factor. And the, the bits are really cool. And it's, it's, it's a unique game in that way. Um, but also, it just feels like sometimes the gimmick takes over. And it's, it's a stronger yeah. part of the game. You don't talk about the strategy of the game when you're talking about it. You talk about the bits and the lights and the colors and the things which tells me you're not talking about a game you're talking about bits and lights and colors <laughs> yeah. so um as we all know sometimes it can be good for us to cut things out of our life when they're no longer beneficial for us forbidden sky is going to be leaving our collection yeet oh my god well, guys, thank you so much for watching. You can find us on Facebook, our YouTube. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan and uh, Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Hi, I'm Ambie, and today I'm going to talk about Super Marchi, a solo game where you're running a grocery store and trying to make as much money as possible. The game takes place over six rounds. Each round you buy different food products and stock your store, and then customers come and buy the food from your store. Customers are represented by cards with different number ranges on them and a space for their shopping cart. For each item they buy, you roll two dice and whatever the range is determines what they want to buy. They can also use a coupon and get two items based on a coupon chart. And if you put items on sale, they can get more things. But if you don't have what they want, then they leave angry, the food in their cart spoils, you don't get any money from them, and you even get a penalty. So you want to make sure that you have the food that the customer wants. There are five customers each round, but only two are face up at any given time, and the dice rolls add more unknowns, so you're not always sure what the customers will want to buy. 
The store can only have 15 items of food in it, and the stockroom can only have 20, so you have to choose carefully at the beginning of each round what foods you'll need to stock your store with in order to serve the customers. Also, you can restock the store only once around, so there's a little bit of press your luck in when you choose to restock it, since once you choose to start a customer, they have to finish their shopping trip or else they'll leave and get a penalty if there's not everything that they want. At the end of each round, some foods will spoil and you'll have to pay to clean them up as well, so you don't want to just buy a bunch of one food because it could spoil. Overall, Super Marchi is a pretty fun resource management and press your luck game that feels pretty thematic with the food spoiling and the angry customers and managing your stock of food. Bye! This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms work together. Today we're looking at Bill and Ted's A Rift in Time, the most excellent board game. Let's take a look at how it plays. I'll come back and tell you what I think. I'm going to give a real quick overview of the game. You're going to be playing as Bill and Ted and his wives as you're trying to deliver historical figures back to the places listed on here. For example, Babe Ruth needs to go to New York. When you're able to send Babe Ruth down to New York and get the rift down to zero, you will have fixed that. If you're able to fix... All of the locations before San Dimas gets to 20 or the Rift deck lines out, then you win. Those are your two lose conditions. On your turn, you're going to draw a Rift card and do something each turn, which will normally move one of the dial up on the Rift. Then you will roll the dice that have been assigned to you. You can gain additional dice by carrying historical figures and do the actions on them. There are bad actions like the Bogus, which will raise Rifts. Or you have movement, which will move you around the board, or interacts, which will allow you to pick up historical figures, deliver them, and decrease the rift at locations. This is a cooperative board game where the players are working together to try to fix the time discrepancies that they've created by going throughout time and moving these historical figures. Bill and Ted is really just a great franchise from my youth. I think most people kind of love it, even though it has some questionable things in it nowadays that I don't think everybody would be on board for if they watched it again. But this is a cooperative board game where the players work together pretty much to play out the first movie. And that means the IP and the mechanisms work great together. It's all been abstracted out of how you're turning the dials and fixing the rifts, but you're taking historical figures, you're picking them up, and you're taking them back in their time and closing any rifts that you've created. And I think it works brilliantly. You get variable powers, You've got a cooperative nature. You get the dice restriction of actions, which actually works here because it's very flexible. And you're getting better dice and better actions as the game goes on. And the game kind of ramps up its tension as you're closing these rifts. You're going to be flying through that card deck more and more. So it all kind of works together in a nice little package. It's a family weight game. It brings the IP in, and we had a great time playing it. And if you're a fan of Bill and Ted and you like doing air guitars, this is definitely something you want to add to your collection, we've had a blast with it. All right, so let's take a look here at the news. A lot of cool, interesting, and a bit of sad news, but we'll get to that in a bit. First, we're going to start from Plan B Games, Eggert Spiel. And they are remaking Great Western Trail with new art. Um, I don't know if they're making any other changes other than new game board and card art, but they're then making this a trilogy because apparently that's Plan B thing now. Make things into trilogies. Mm. This is coming out this year, the new Great Western Trail. And then in 2022, there will be an Argentina version. And in 2023, there will be a New Zealand version. And so... If you, Great Western Trail, one of the most popular games that there is, for sure. Probably Fister's most popular game, Alexander Fister. Um, the trilogy thing, I think, will make people happy. I'm curious how many changes will be there. But on a personal level, I am blown away by how much better that cover looks. It is – I saw someone who said the original one was Zombie Cowboys. I saw that comment somewhere, too, on BGG somewhere, yeah. And I thought, you're right. That is true. <laughs> I really like these panoramic pictures. I especially like the the middle one, I think. But they all look good. So we'll see. I don't know that I need three great Western Trail games. But if you like it, there you go. All right. <laughs> all right. Moving on. Get out of here. Get out so this here. was kind of <laughs> my word. Children. All right. <laughs> I hope the, everybody saw that. No, we. Okay, it doesn't matter. No, right, I, hope they, I hope the audience saw it. It'll they right. be there forever. 
Anyway, so the Arano Gulo and okay, I, I can't say all these names properly, but um, the people, one of them, Luciani, Simone Luciani, for sure. Um, the people who originally started Cranio Creations have acquired a majority share of it. When I got this, I thought, how is this news? But the fact is, is that Cranio <clears throat> Creations was owned by another company, Centauria. And these, okay. these folks were minority shareholders. So they basically bought out the majority shareholders. And so now the designers and the people who <clears throat> love the company are going to be running Cranio Creations. I don't know what that means for the companies. I mean, they, it seems like a nice breakup of sorts. They bought them out. They said nice things and everything. But I do think it's interesting to see that gamers now own this company when apparently that was not the case before. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was. Go ahead, Zing. Go, uh, no, no, don't. Please. You, it's business. Go ahead. I um, was. I, I didn't know about this news, Tom. I, I first saw this when, when I looked at this this morning. Um, and uh, uh, yes, exactly what you said. These are the guys, these are the guys that were the face of the company. Right. Uh, that I would meet with and talk to them about their their games, and they are good guys. I am very happy that they're completely in control of the company now. I didn't even know that they weren't. You know, that's kind of one of those things that like was a really behind the scenes thing that it was another company, Centauri, that was the owner or the majority owner in Caranio and and Lorenzo and Giuliano and and Simone were the um, were the minority holders. But this is great news for them. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. All right, yep. let's take a look now at some upcoming games from Yellow. So first right. we have two here. We have Royal Visit and Catapult Feud. Now Royal Visit is actually a remake of an older game. Uh, what's it called? Times Square. Yes, Times Square. Yeah, from right. right. Okay, that was yeah, in the, yeah. a two-player tug of war. Two-player line. <laughs> and Catapult Feud is also another two-player game where you are fighting with catapults, although I don't know if it's actual catapults or not. That would that actually would change my opinion of the game. I want Do you, you mean catapults. physical components that launch something physical? Yes. yes. I hope while, not, because that sounds while, super gimmicky. Yeah, while, yeah <laughs> while those things are cute, <laughs> and you know we've seen them like with, younger games like for kids and things uh, obviously i would hope that this was a an abstracted catapult type of thing yes i agree with that man all right well then we have some more games uh from yellow we have sticky cthulhu which initially sounds like one of the worst titles of a game ever the it's evocative of things i would prefer not to think about <laughs> but this is an offshoot of their game Sticky Chameleons, which essentially had those, like, remember those sticky things? If, if you ever had these when you were a kid, you threw them against the, the, the wall, and they would, like, flop down. They'd climb down the wall. Right. So that's what Sticky Chameleons is. You have these, and you were, like, you have you hold part in your hand, and you throw it at the table and try to grab a card and pull it to your hand. And it's a silly game. It's probably a one-time game for most people. Like, you play it, you're like, ha-ha, that was hilarious, and then you move on. Yeah. Well, this one is the same thing, but with Cthulhu. You're, you're, you're literally throwing things on the board to try to, like, stick onto them? Is that what you're yeah, saying? You're holding, like, a, you're holding, like, a gummy hand. It used yeah. to be a tongue. It used to, you know, with, like, a little gummy string to it. And then you hang onto the tip of the string and you throw the, you know, you whack this thing. And so it'll stretch. Oh. And it'll you tr you're trying to aim at something on a table. Whoop! And if you hit the card... You yank back on this, you know, long sticky string, and then you pull the card back. So it meant to it was meant to replicate like chameleons shooting at bugs yep. with their tongue. It's very visually hilarious. Like it's a, it's a great one time, like Tom's saying, experience. Like you I'm not sure that sticky chameleons hand. and how stupid and sort of silly that is goes hand in hand with Cthulhu. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> Throw Cthulhu in it by all means, because I guess you know that's the thing to do. Yeah, you're eating cultists now. Okay, well, why hmm. not? Sure, why not? I mean, yeah, awesome. I think the game here that a lot of people will get pumped about is Little yeah. Factory, considering how popular Little Town seems to have been. Little Town was a very simple uh, game of worker placement style game. So now they got Little Factory, which is I get would assume would be a simple resource management game. This is the same cool. designers. And then they have For the King and Me, 
This is a reskin of Biblios, which I'm not as excited about because I, I mean, I know Biblios is a good game, but I really like the theming of Biblios, the library theme. I like this one. I'm excited about this one. I mean, I'm, I'm most excited about Royal Visit. It's been out of print many, many years. I'm, I, that's a much better theme. But then after that, yeah, for the king and me, I'm excited about it. I like Biblios, but the theme that they had before, not that this is going to be exciting, but it was so dreary. It was very dry. And this, hopefully, from the look of the cover anyway, it looks to be at least a little lighter and sillier and uh, Disney-fied. You know, some of these characters look like they escaped, like, from uh, Beauty and the Beast or something. And I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. All right. Well, let's jump into more reprints. Renegade is doing Gravwell, second edition, uh, with artwork from Quanche Mori. And my word, that cover is great. I love that. Yes. <laughs> I love that artwork. That's a good and Gravwell is a really unique racing game in a sense where you are trying to escape you're trapped in a black hole. So you are essentially using repulsor beams to bounce off different elements and other spaceships, trying to bounce to the very beginning. It's one of the most unique games I've played, I think. Uh, and so I'm glad to see a second edition coming. It was really cool. big. The time when it came out, it, it got a big buzz and didn't really hear about it. I maybe it went out of print. Actually, I don't even know that um, if it did or didn't. But um, this is a uh, this is exciting to see it come back again. More of the same stuff in a sense. We have War Chest and second expansion Siege coming out. This is so War Chest, an abstract strategy game, which is fantastic with heavy poker chips from AEG. Now you have fortified locations, but of course you get trebuchets. Siege Towers, and the like. It looks like you have four new pieces. I think. Maybe there's more. Oh, no. Three new units. Are they real trebuchets? Are they really shooting things at things? Oh, my the, word. Yeah. No. Well, then this is hot garbage, isn't it, Tom? Don't judge me, okay? Don't judge, judge me because you made a bad joke and I brought it back. It wasn't a joke. I actually like actual catapults. It was a joke. Everything you say is a joke. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> All right, South by Southwest. Um, before we jump into South by Southwest, is it happening? Uh, I doubt it, but they're probably just and they're doing the awards anyway, the same way that everybody did their awards. Most sure, most we're gonna talk about the awards. I'm just, I was curious because you know, South by Southwest, if I remember correctly, this was the first convention to cancel due to the coronavirus. Okay. If you remember, we got out of Dice Tower West and then South by Southwest got canceled. And that, and, gamma, that yeah, and then and Gamma ran, but that right, was Gamma it. ran, but but South by Southwest is a much bigger event. I mean, it's a huge event. Yeah, yeah. So mm. I'm I'm guessing it's canceled. It says it's going to begin on March 16th and end on March 20th. Oh, no in-person attendance. Okay, so right. I guess it's virtual. There you go. All right. Anyway, they announced their tabletop game of the year awards. They often pick fairly good games. Yeah. So they have Calico, Fort, Oceans, The Crew, and The Search for Planet X. Right. I the, couldn't what, tell you which one would win. I have yeah. The, the the one thing I saw was that they actually you know that's a solid slate of games. So it really yeah. is. Congratulations. It's definitely a mid weight group. Then you know they're they're picking games that appeal to I think the largest audience in some ways of hobby gamers. Yeah. Well, yeah, of hobby gamers, sure. But they're also yeah. there's no heavy games on there. But there's also no real light games either. Sure. So It's a good good slate for sure. All right, let's. Talk about Metal Gear Solid. This is a sad news to some degree. Metal Gear Solid, designed by Emerson Matsuchi, uh, and IDW is basically not happening. This was actually, if you remember, this was in my top 10 most anticipated games from 2020 and did not come out. So Emerson has the rights to the game back. I don't know if he has the licensing there, and he's trying he to work not. it out. He does not have the licensing, but he gets the design back. Uh, this this is a very interesting thing. It doesn't. It did not go into, and I have not yet found the reason that IDW is not producing the game. There was it. It was just like, oh, we're not going to do the game. Did what happened? Why not? I mean, obviously, it's got a following. IDW has had a very checkered financial past. They're a public company. 
uh, owned the publishing arm owned by a bigger company called IDW Media Holdings, uh, and they've been losing a lot of money. Well, so, I'm actually so curious about that game. We remember we played it, um, the Batman animated game on Kickstarter Z. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And has that come out yet? I don't know. I, I don't believe no, so. No, I just looked at it. They just got the box cover art for it. Okay. And that game was supposed to be delivered in December. So, well, it's I mean, not but, a tremendously long amount of time for a game that involves miniatures, but. I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea about their, their finances, uh, like Bonacore saying. I just figured the first time I saw a glimpse of the uh, of this news, I, I thought it might have something to do with the license and some sort of licensing problem with Metal Gear Solid itself. Perhaps that's not it. I don't know. So yeah, I, know. I don't know either. I'm going to research this more because this is actually a very interesting story to me. All right, Peterson Games, best known for Cthulhu Wars, has a new game coming called Monster Invasion, and it's coming out on GameFound. That's another very big Kickstarter company moving to GameFound. I think that's pretty interesting news. We've seen oh. Lucky Duck move there, and now we're seeing Peterson Games go there. It uh, looks like kind of a cool game. It's um, four new games. That they're going to be launching together. They're all different. They all have monsters. We have Marry the Monster, um, which my wife said was her theme game. I'm not sure what that meant. Um, <coughs> there's that one. I think we might have that one here in the office, actually. It seems familiar. Yeah, I'm looking uh, at it. Uh, then we got Invasion of the Brood, which is War of the Worlds meets Independence Day. I like that theming. <laughs> like, if you have stuff that's... No, I do. I like the idea of fighting off aliens. Isn't uh, War of the Worlds meet Independence Day redundant, though? Yeah, it's... Well... It's, they're both a very similarly themed... Sure, show, War of the movie. Worlds, we didn't beat them. It was... Shh. Spoilers, oh, no. man. I haven't Are read that book me? yet. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> this is like a 19... This Spoilers. is a book. Spoilers. Um, it's, on my ter- it's on my Kindle. Catch a palooza for books. <laughs> a, I have it on VHS. Hmm. The movie. What's this? Oh, my yeah. word. Yeah. All right. What's this uh, Dracula everybody's talking about? <laughs> All right. They also have Evacuate, Don't Outrun the Monster, Outrun Your Friends. It's a community deck building game using social deduction to outwit other players and get to the transport with the most survivors. That just sounds fun. I hope it's good, but that. that- that sounds great that, that I would be able to like you know throw you under the bus while I got onto the uh, onto the evacuation ship. That is that is awesome. Doesn't that sound fun? I, I don't oh, know. Hoping yeah. that's good. And then and then uh, the last one is potions and profits, a bidding, bluffing, and auction game, which that one doesn't sound as interesting as the other. The, the one I'm most interested in is evacuate, but I'm just hoping it's good. But anyway, all four of these together on GameFound. So I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's cool. I'm I'm glad to see uh, Peterson Games doing smaller, sort of more accessible projects because uh, usually their games are quite, you know, grandiose and, well, and epic in scales. So these sound like a different, uh, you know, like they're designed for a different market, different target. I like what it. Are they, what are they known for? Uh, Cthulhu, Cthulhu Wars, Cthulhu the Wars. giant, you know, yeah, okay. so epic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warantha, and they they make these huge games. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, yeah, this will. Uh, looking forward to seeing these games. These are very interesting. Now, the opposite of huge games, we have the game Face to Face. This is coming from Pandasaurus. This is so the game is a cooperative game in which you are trying to build different piles of cards together. This is a competitive game, a two player version. I'm really intrigued with this, actually. I I'm curious how this will be turned from cooperative to competitive. I I want to say that uh, this has been out already from NSV. It's possible. I, it never was only did German. play it. I, I I just you know I, I didn't check it out. But um, yeah, yeah, it might be an interesting spin on it. And folks who've played it again, I think this has been out. If you've played it and you know you're uh, if you know it, then let us know in the comments right now. Would you you know what you thought of it? All righty. Especially in comparison to the original game. <clears throat> All right. So in more sad news of sorts, especially if you like Legends of the Five Rings, the card game, 
Fantasy Flight has announced that they are shutting that game down, that the next set will be the conclusion to the game. Now, Fantasy Flight has a good record of usually when they finish a living card game, they give you some advance notice. It's done, and they say it's complete. This one, Legend of the Five Rings, has had a spotty history with Fantasy Flight ever since they bought it from AEG. When they first bought it, they put it out, and then they had some weird issues with releasing their monthly packs and then released a whole pile at once. Remember that, Z? I do. That's right. That's right. They were doing the, uh, gosh, what was it, eight or five packs, five weeks, or eight packs, eight weeks. I forget what it was called. But yeah, instead of doing a monthly release where they would drop a legend pack, I don't know what they call them, you know, the, 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 the pack of cards, once a month, they did once a week. And then there was a giant gap until the next cycle began. And so the game found its meta, and then there was nothing new to inject cards to, to shake that up. Right. I do remember that being a, a bit of a, a blunder, yeah, from on their part. They kept it going longer than I thought they would, I'll be honest with you. Because I remember when this was around, they did that twice. I want to say they did that rolling schedule twice. I thought, oof, this is not gonna, this is not gonna last uh, more than two years. And so they kept it going for a long time. Legends of the Five Rings, I think you guys know, but just for everybody else, has been one of those um, those IPs and games that have a very rabid fan base. Oh, it's for been sure. Going on since the the mid '90s, right after Magic: The Gathering. Um, I think that in this announcement that they're talking about, they're now going to put out other games, uh, including a role-playing game uh, and some books that are going to come out with this. It's a very rich um, IP. I think that it will do well with other things coming out under it. Um, so I'm, I'm, ex I'm kind of excited to see what they're going to do with this game. What do you mean what they're going to do with it? They're closing it. No, but they're coming out with a role-playing game based on it. And I thought I read in here, and I could be wrong. Yeah, but the role-playing game, okay, right. The role-playing game is coming from Edge, not them, and novels from another book company. Aconite they say is they, them. Aconite is Asmodee. Same thing. Well, yeah, but that's not fit. Here's the thing. First of all, this is, as far as I can tell, I might be wrong. I think this is the final competitive living card game. That they're all The only ones that still exist are all cooperative. If I'm if I'm counting correctly, they still have Lord of the Rings, um, the Arkham Horror, and Marvel. And those are all cooperative games. Really? There's no... That's it? I guess you're right. The only hmm. other one... I don't know if Game of Thrones is still running or not. Um, if so, then that one's competitive. But they've also gotten rid of X-Wing and stuff. I, here's... My concern is... Will Fantasy Flight even matter in a year? This Descent game that's coming out better blow people's socks off. If it does not do well, I just can't see Fantasy Flight. What do they have? What's there to be excited about that company? They used to be the most exciting company in the business. Like, we would go to the in-flight reports and sit there like on, you know, like, oh, what's Christian Peterson going to announce? And now it's kind of like, I, I, what is there to get excited about? They got Keyforge, I guess. I got to see what... Keyforge is what, still, yeah, it's still strong, I think. I, I don't it think is, it's strong, though. I think it's uh, okay. No, no, I think it's, I think it's very highly selling for them, but... Are you just making up that that stat though? How do you know? Because of the millions of decks that have been registered on their site. There oh was... no, yeah, sure, decks have been registered, but I'm telling but, you, I think L5R died also partially because of the coronavirus. There's no in play in stores, and I think that hurts sure, Keyforge too. Sure. Uh, yeah. so with Magic: The Gathering having a record year, that's a very hard thing to actually say. It's possible. Magic the Gathering had its best year ever last year. You, I think we reported on that no, last no, time. I understand yes. that. But, but Magic has a different selling point than a living card game, for sure. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I heard what you said about <clears throat> Fantasy Flight. It was like painful to even hear you say it. I want to go now look and see what they've announced over the last year and, and into this new year to see if that is really true because well, you're 100 percent right they were the number one most exciting company because they were the biggest so let's yeah so see what, what they've announced that's coming up they have the new x-men mutant insurrection which we'll be doing a four-way review of i believe today so 
Uh, more thoughts on that at three, so you can see what we think about that game. And then they got the scent. And then everything else that they announced that their in-flight report at Gen Con, it's been passed off to other companies. The X-Wing stuff. I mean, I watched an in-flight report. There was not much there. Now, Champions, I know, is doing gangbusters. Yes. That one, I know, is doing really well. But I don't know. It just feels like Asmodee keeps scraping off parts of them <laughs> to someone else. That's what it feels like. But, but I still just... say that they got rid of Legend of the Five Rings uh, to make room for the come on, eventual Fallout living card game. Let's go! <laughs> See, you've been saying this for like three, four years now. <laughs> and the year it happens, I will feel validated. There you go. <laughs> right. I'm going to stop commenting, but this is, it's interesting. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uno Remix. This is my favorite story. So Uno is 50 years old, younger than Steven. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's true. Oh, that's horrible. Thank you very much. Oh, cool. And so Mattel's releasing new versions of the game because they say because of the 50th anniversary, but the real reason is money. Money. <laughs> but anyway, they released Uno Remix, which I'm going to have to go hunt down now. So you get to add cards to the deck and write on them. So this is essentially Uno Legacy. <laughs> Something I think we must have made a joke about in the past somewhere. I'll tell you what, though. I have I saw this announcement a couple of weeks ago, I think, when it first was sort of bubbling around. And um, this is the most boring way to do Legacy that I could have possibly imagined. Because you're not adding new effects. You are just... Writing on the cards, who the card may target. <laughs> All mine like, are going to say dad on them. The kids are like, draw two yeah, cards. So dad. it's like, draw two cards <laughs> to Maria, as it says there on the cover. So instead of opening up avenues and, and creating new things, you're actually just shutting the game down and making it narrower. So that that copy now works with Maria better than with anybody else in the world. It just... why is this I don't know. This doesn't do. sound good to me, Tom. And that's taking Uno and, every, and whatever you think of it out of the equation. I don't, I don't think this sounds good. That's actually a very... Your point is very well taken that you've just turned this into a, a even more terrible take that. Because now it's take that Z. Right? It's, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And every card, like, and, and you don't draw them, and I draw them. It's like before this version. Oh, now nah, they're really going to fight. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> you know what? I'm getting one, and you and me, Tom, are going to play this in for pie or something like that. Okay, yeah, we'll do it. That, <laughs> that's a great thing to do, right? <laughs> All righty. Last piece of news here okay. Fury of Dracula is on the App Store for Android and Apple devices. That's pretty cool. I didn't even know they were working on it. I, 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 I'm literally, if I had my iPad here, I have my iPhone, I should do it. I'm going to buy this game as soon as this, this is over. This is one of my favorite games in the world. If there's a billion rules in this game and it, and if this thing plays with like, you know, um, uh, the system can run the players and, or the, or Dracula, I, I'm so in, I'm, I'm yeah. buying this immediately. I love this game. I agree with that, Steven. Uh, I don't know. It's, it sounds weird to hear you say this game has a million rules, but you love War of the Ring and you know Twilight Imperium and stuff like that. I don't think it's nearly as complex. But being able to have the game run some of the AI for you, oof, yeah, I, I could. Because it's a hard game to get to the table a little bit because yeah, of that. Yeah, that's that's all I meant. It's uh, yeah. yeah it's, the other two you mentioned, you know, especially Twilight Imperium and definitely War of the Ring are also big rule stints. This one just has a lot of corner cases. Well, how do the wolves work? When does it have, you know, there's this weird cases in the game. It's big. I love it, though. Love it. And I'm buying this as soon as I get off this call. Can I leave now? All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break here with some contributors, and then we'll be back for our game show. That's the news. Hey everybody, Ron here, here to talk to you about affordable board games. Affordable board games are games with an MSRP of $30 or less, so they won't break the bank. Today, I'm going to be talking about Ticket to Ride London. Ticket to Ride London is a board game that plays two to four players ages eight and up, 15 minutes playtime. In my experience, it takes 20, with a $20 MSRP. The objective of the game is to score as many points as possible while completing routes from one destination to the other. 
It's set up. You take two destination tickets, but you have to keep at least one. Get your buses, your two train tickets, and you're ready to go. At a typical turn, you can do one of three things. You can either claim two destination tickets, but you must keep at least one. You can collect up to two bus tickets, or you can claim a route. You claim a route by discarding the number of bus tickets equal to the spaces on the route and lay that number of buses down. The end game. When one person has two buses or less, everyone else gets a final turn, then the person who triggered the end game goes. You kind of get points from your routes, destination tickets, and neighborhood bonuses. Whoever has the most points wins. Now, I love this game because it's a great little entry Euro game that takes a short amount of time, and it plays great at two players and all the way up to four. And that was Ticket to Ride London. I hope you folks enjoy, and until next time, see you later. Happy breakfast everyone, today I'm going to talk to you about Dixit. It's a game with abstract artwork and lots of words and sort of meaning linking that makes it great for a family. Basically everyone is put on the same level playing field. One person is going to look at their cards, pick one and sort of make a word, a saying or a noise that links something on that card. Maybe it's travel, maybe it's sort of a honking of a horn, maybe it's wind, magic, something like that, and they're going to say this word without showing anyone the card. Everyone else is looking at their cards and are going to try and find a card that has that vibe, that meaning on theirs, and they're going to try and effectively trick others into thinking that theirs was the original card. Now, out of all of the versions, you've got so many expansions and kind of two base games. You've got uh, the original one, which is just Dixit, and I think it's Dixit Odyssey, I'll put uh, there what, which one it actually is, um, that is effectively got a slightly larger player count and a better board. That's the one to go for. And then, if you want, there's so many expansions. They don't really add more content in terms of gameplay, they just add more cards. So more variety into the mix rather than anything massively changing. But it's a fun one that, you know, every time you get a new deck, it just refreshes the game and means there's so many new combos and stuff. And everyone can just have fun and enjoy the artwork. It makes it a really top family game for me. So why am I talking about family games? Well, me and Dan Hughes, also a Dice Tower contributor, have just recorded our top five family games. So some other great ones there. Dixit for me was the one, an honourable mention, that just missed the list. We also talk about Cora Quest, a little bit of an interview there about his current Kickstarter. So check that out on East Gaming UK, my personal YouTube channel. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your breakfast, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. On this episode of By the Numbers, I'm continuing my Through the Years series, where I look the best game on Board Game Geek by year. Started with 1970, this time 2006. Take a look at the top five in 2006. We see the number one game is Through the Ages, A Story of Civilization, coming in at number 48. Through the Ages is a card-driven civilization game where you're managing resources, developing new technologies, installing all kinds of interesting leaders, managing your military, through three ages of history. Although I haven't played the original version of Through the Ages, A Story of Civilization, I have and love the new version, the 2015 version, Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. That one's rated actually much higher than the original, all the way at number six. But unfortunately, when I get around to 2015, we won't be talking about this game. Take a look at the ratings, almost 18,000 of them. We see lots of eights for an overall rating of 7.9. Take a look at the weight, it comes in at a 4.17. Super heavy game, lots of rules. This is a hard game to teach and play, but I was shocked to find out there are 10 games in the Board Game Geek Top 100 that are rated heavier than Through the Ages, the original version. The new version is one of those 10. So if you're looking for an epic civilization game, has leaders, governments, military, all sorts of stuff, but no map, this might be the game for you. All right, folks, it's time for our weekly showdown. Today's contestants, Stephen and Mr. Z. 
are going up against each other in our straw poll game, where I make up a poll. I asked you the audience questions. In fact, the first one I'm putting into the comments right now. And you can vote on this poll. And then they're going to try to guess the second most guessed answer. So here's how the points work. Each of them will guess an answer. They have to pick different answers. So we'll go back and forth between them. If they pick the second most guessed answer, they get four points. If they pick the third most guessed answer, they get two points. But every other answer they guess gives the people points. If they pick the fourth or fifth answer, they give the people one point. If they pick the first answer, they give the people two points. And if they pick the last answer, the one that gets the least number of votes, they give the people three points. Does All right, score, are you ready? Does this scoring system change every week? It does <laughs> not matter. All it right. Does. Are there any other new rules? Yeah, any rules you're introducing? No, nah, there's no yet, other new rule. Let us change the point yeah. scoring slightly. Here until, we go. Until the last round, then there'll be new rules. Which I think it's time the, to innovate with this game, Tom. I'm just Which saying. of the following would terrify you the most if it was gigantic, like kaiju size? All right, this is in honor of the new King Kong vs. Godzilla movie. So which of these creatures would terrify you the most if it was kaiju size? And we have cockroach, oh. rat... Mosquito, fire ant, centipede, or wasp? Jeez. Cockroach, rat, mosquito, fire ant, centipede, or wasp? And since Bonagore beat me last week, he gets to go first. Mosquito, cockroach, ant, wasp, centipede. Fire ant, I think, is the one you didn't say. Yeah. Fire ant. Okay, so mosquito, cockroach, fire ant, wasp, centipede. And rat is what you said. Yeah. Yep. Which one would scare me the most if it was kaiju size? Uh, uh, there's no good answer to this question because they would all. I would be running. Yeah, are you kidding you, me? I mean, this is insanity. This is absolute insanity. I mean, if you set the size of a dog, then I'd be like, okay, well, but I would, like would still. Kaiju, I would still. I question. would still. Be hiding I mean, if it you was could the be size like of a dog. It could be the See, cutest, fluffiest thing, like a cute kitten. Kaiju sized is still terrifying. I think that kaiju size for is less scary. Like let's say for example, there was a, a <laughs> let's say cockroach for example, a yeah. cockroach that's giant size. I'd be afraid of that, but it it wouldn't. If they were like dog size, it could get in my house and come after me. I think are you like giving away like the logic behind this thing now? No, to us? no, no. I got what to... he's saying. I um, I think I'm just scared of very, very large, massive things, no matter what it is, Tom. Yes, you're a jerk, Z. You're a jer I'm gonna go. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I didn't know there's no, you. there's no answer to this. No, question. not you, That's weirdo. Possible. Like I'm scared of like being right next to, and it's gotten better, but I'm scared of being like right next to a, a ship. You know, I'm scared oh. of being next to you. So All right, let's get on to this game. game. Okay, I'm going got, wasp. Wasp. That's a dumb choice, and That's you're a... dumb for making it. <laughs> Is that what you were going to pick, Z? No. No. Oh. Um, There's no good answer here. That's a good one, though. That's a good one. Uh, I'm trying to think of people, things people are aware of. That's the thing. Cockroach is one. I mean, there's no denying cockroach is going to be one. Right, the other ones... nobody, nobody knows what these things are? No, like mosquito might be my choice. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people don't deal with mosquitoes. Pick it. Pick it. You understand what I'm saying? Mosquito. Um, Pick one. That's number one. Pick I don't it. want to, though. Mosquito. He's taking it? Yeah, I'm taking it. That's number one, I think. I don't know. No way. Cockroach is number one no. by 12 votes. All right. The final one, number six, neither of you picked it, was rat. rat. All right. Yeah. Then... Fire Ant was number five. I almost picked that. Number four, giving the people one point, is Mosquito. Yeah. <laughs> number three, as opposed to what both of you said, was Cockroach. Number two, this would have been my number one, because I think it's scary enough as an actual creature, is Centipede. And the number one answer is Wasp. Yeah, so that's right. In You're round wrong one, too. the people got three points. Congratulations, everybody. I, I like when the people win. I just don't like when Z or Tom win. So Fine. I'm, I'm okay let's, let's go nicer. <laughs> Which of these mythical animals 
would you most want to see in person? All right, so we got some mythical animals. Which of these would you most like to see in person? A unicorn, a griffin, a dragon, a leviathan, a centaur, or pegasus? All right, so we got unicorn, griffin, dragon, leviathan, centaur, or pegasus. Which of those would you like to see in person? Okay. Now, I, I gave no other qualifications, like how dangerous they were, or whatever, you know, just what, you know, just, which one would you like to see? You go first, see? I think, right? Well, let's give the people a bit of time. Okay. Vote. Give the people some time. Um, give them some in the last see. one, we had 123 votes. That's, that's pretty good. 40 All right. people <clears> voted <throat> for the box. Only 20 people voted for Cockroach. So that was a, a, a pretty big swing there. That's interesting. Cockroach, I figured, would be very close to the top of the list. Oh, sometimes, All right. sometimes it's really going to hurt me. All right, Z, which one would you most like to see in person? Would I most like to see in person? Well, we just talked about the big thing, so Leviathan is out. <laughs> I didn't um, ask what you wanted to see, but yes, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Um, most want to see in person. This is one. This is. I'm going to say Pegasus. Pegasus. All so right. wrong. So wrong. The obvious answer uh -huh. for number two yeah. is the lovely unicorns. I, I want to see. I think that's I want to see. No, dragon is number one. Dragon. Who would not want to see a dragon fire? <sighs> All right. People who live in wooden houses. <laughs> Number six is Leviathan. Yeah, and that's right. actually that's actually one I would like to see. But I'd like to eh. see them all. All right. Number five was Centaur. Um, that's just weird. You know what I mean? It <laughs> yeah, just makes you uncomfortable. When you see that, you're like, oh, oh excuse me. You, you, see the commercial, <laughs> you see the commercial with the Motar? That's no. So, that's so dumb. It's, okay. You ever saw that commercial? Oh, yeah. It's all yeah. the time. It's so dumb. Number four, shockingly, giving the people another point, unicorn. What? Number three, griffin, because griffins are cooler than unicorns, apparently. Come on. Come on. All right, so number one at 47 votes, number two at 36 votes. Bonacore, you were right, but that's good for Z. Dragon yeah. was number one. Pegasus ah. was number two. You are so lucky. Our current scores are people four, Z four. Mr. Bonacor, zero. Yes. Oh, and the game going. is over suddenly. <laughs> no, there are seven questions. Here we go. go ahead. The next one. Let's say you wanted to play an RPG right now. Yes, which of these six character classes would you pick? So you got to figure out which of these character classes the people would pick. Right. Would they pick bard, ranger, monk, barbarian, warlock, or paladin? Bard, ranger, monk, Barbarian, Warlock, or Paladin? I'm not saying what the RPG is. doesn't matter. Like, if you had to pick one for a bard, character ranger. class, which one of those would you pick? From Bard, yeah. Ranger, Monk, barba Barbarian, Warlock, and Paladin. Got it. You're missing so many good ones in here. I deliberately put not at the most common ones in yeah, here. I know, I know, I know. Um, I be a, a half elk. A half, a half elk. Yes, a, he said a half elk. He's gonna be. What? Who that goes means first? You only go to the lodge <laughs> part of the week. <laughs> All right. Anyway, <laughs> not that kind of elk. <laughs> All right. Sorry. That That's a really, witty. really weird that joke. Very, that was very witty, Tom. I like that one. <laughs> All right. Um, Who I guess first? Mr. Bodic, or you're first. All right. So the obvious. <laughs> I would stop it's saying so, obvious until you actually so, get it. It's so obvious, yeah. It's the obvious answer to pick that'll be close to the top, I hope. But who knows? I will pick Ranger. All right. I don't know. This is so hard. I'm going to go with uh, Bard. I'm a, I'm, I love Bards. I'm going to go with Bard. I personally love the monk class, but... I'm playing a fighter right now, a standard fighter, and I'm all righty. Well, fighter. I'm going to actually start with the scores this time, because the scores are now currently Bonacore still with zero, Z still with four, but the people have jumped up to nine 
because you picked the first and last answers. Bard was the lowest. Ranger was the highest. Wow. Um, that is second awesome. Second was Paladin. Third, Warlock. Fourth, Monk. Fifth, Barbarian. So Ranger won this one by my a other, landslide. My other choice would have been Barbarian. So I, I would have been bad no matter what. what I got the two? two bottom choices. I guess nobody's going to fight me for a character in a, in a role-playing session. You know? I'm like, I want to be a bard. Sure, who cares? Sure, who am I? Who is the singing guy? Get, get lost. All right, That's I'm going to explain the next poll before I post it for the people, because I just in case I worded things incorrectly here. But So we're sticking with RPGs. So you're with your party. You run into a group of bad guys in an RPG. So what is your preferred way of dealing with them? Here are the choices. Strike first and fast. Talk, but be prepared to fight if you need to. Negotiation, where you fight only as a last resort, or sneak around them, avoiding the encounter entirely, talk with them with the intent of deceiving them, or just set up a bunch of traps and ambushes to destroy them. So did, what was the setup on this? This is the, what you is your single... A bad guys, a bunch, it doesn't matter who, run into some bad guys in RPG, what's your preferred way of dealing with them? Strike first and fast, talk, but be prepared to fight, negotiation where fighting is only a last resort, sneak around them and just avoid the encounter completely, talk with them, with the intent of deception, or set up traps and ambushes to destroy them. Right, and you said, these are the bad guys. Yeah, so what's your preferred way? Because people play RPGs in different ways. Sure. So what's the yeah. way you would prefer? You forgot the obvious, play my loot and draw them <laughs> out into the woods. That's right. <laughs> Bard at heart. Is it me first this time? It is. All right, I'm going to go with the one that's speaking to me here is the second one you said, talk, but be ready for action. I think it's something like that, what you said. Okay. So the obvious answer is... Oh, here we go. <laughs> of course, you said they're bad guys, and you know they're bad guys. They might have been... That's the, they're the bad the guys. guys. Who, these are the guys are looking for. You strike first, you strike hard. And when you're playing the, the big half-orc, eight-foot-tall fighter, you go in there and you, well, cleaving. Awesome. So that's your choice? Yes. I'm going, I'm trying to pick, I pick number one every time, but I think I just could try the hardest one. I'm trying to go for the highest one. No, I picked three number ones, I think. All right, I'm calling it here. This All is right. the closest votes we've ever had. Yeah, this is a hard one. Cool. The cool. last place was negotiation, <laughs> fighting only as a last resort, and then sneaking around them was the second last, and talking to them with the intent of deception. Then the other ones, we had 34, 33, and 32 votes. Jeez, come on. Wow. Number one, with two points to the people, Z, talk, but prepare, be prepared to fight. Number two was setting up traps and ambushes. Number three, strike first and fast. This wow. Brings the you got points. You got points. 11. Did the audience Z hear is that these were the four, bad guys? The bad guys. And Bonacore is two. Hey, not everything is resolved with violence, Mr. Bonacore. When they're the bad guys, it is. Bad All guys right. is subjective. You know what I mean? If they make a <laughs> compelling enough argument... Maybe I'll be a bad guy. I like okay. Mr. Dreadful said your Z, your motto is loot and loot. <laughs> so anyhow. Loot and loot. That's right, baby. Loot and loot. I like it. Sounds like a good TV show. Anyhow, the next one here, still talking about role playing. Which kind of role playing setting most interests you? Okay. So I'm asking people. So we got fantasy, space, post apocalyptic, cyberpunk, superhero, or horror. Fantasy, space, post-apocalyptic, cyberpunk, superhero, and horror. And I know there's many more than that, folks, but those are some of the main ones. That's pretty much all of them that people are really playing. Almost. Uh, who goes first? I'm just, I'm thinking still. I believe you are going to be going first. So, no, you got a few few votes coming in still. All right, I'm going to wait until you know, we get more votes, right? Okay. Sure. Now, okay, so which one would you personally prefer? So it's, you know, it doesn't matter what you pick here. Like, what, what would you play? Me? Oh, I play, I play fantasy 
almost all the time. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm a, I've been a D and D player since <laughs> uh, like first edition. You know. I think my favorite is actually superhero. What about you, Z? Post-apocalyptic. Really? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know if it was that or cyberpunk for you, Z. But. All right. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there's not as many, clearly, as all the other ones. Um, I think post-apocalyptic might be the, the the least represented. But, yeah, I do like that setting. All right, Mr. Boniger, what's your pick? Well, the obvious answer for number one yes. is fantasy. It's yes. absolutely, if it's not, I'm going to eat this card. I would love uh, to see that. People change I hope, votes I, quickly. I hope change your votes quickly. But I will... Um, <laughs> But I will pick. Oh, I, I'm. I'm going out on a limb, I think, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna pick space. All right, space. space the final the frontier. New fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with horror. It's not a bad choice. The Vampire of the Eternal Struggle, uh, Vampire of the Masquerade, rather, has been very popular for a long time. Werewolf came, were, Werewolf, Mage, all that, that whole well, world of darkness. Unfortunately, Mr. Boniger does not have to eat his card because not only was fantasy first, it almost got half the vote, 47%. Yeah, of yeah. course. Mind-blowing. But the one that would have gotten you both four points was Cyberpunk. Was really? Number, two. number three. Post-apocalyptic. Oh, These get some points. You guys oh. get the four. Oh, not. Fifth, I said sir, horror. Which was horror, was four. Space was five. Superhero comes in last with six. Giving the people two more points. It's now 13 to four to two. This uh, game is broken. Broken. The game is broken. <laughs> We're getting too many people. points. Rigged. Well, you guys keep... Not, I'm surprised I've never seen you miss so many answers. All right, let's try the next one here. Which of the following appeals to you most, to the people watching this, if you're not board gaming? So of the following, what other hobby is appealing to you? So I have role-playing games, collectible or living card games, video games, playing miniature games. That's one. And then the other is painting and building miniatures, because they're two different things, and puzzles. So which of the following appeals to you most, if not board gaming? Role-playing games? Collectible living card games, video games, playing miniature games, painting and building miniatures, or puzzles. Because we all, I mean, I didn't put board games on here for obvious reasons. I would assume. I think it's Z. Going first, right? Oh, I've got to wait. Oh, I gotta wait. Wanna... Although I do wonder if I could put on here, like, watching and reading content about board games. I wonder if that'd be, there's a, I know that some people talk more about board games than they actually play them. Yeah, that's a fun thing in and of itself, just sort of being around games and, you know, the chatter about games, just like anything. I mean, be talking about movies or watching people, you know, react to movies. I mean, that's fun, too. Uh, uh, all right. Who's first? Z, what do you got I'm here? i go with uh, Cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I no. will win something. No, uh, I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with video games. I'm curious to see what what happens with that. Yeah, yeah, that was gonna be my pick. Okay. Um. Uh. All right. I'll. I'll go. I'll go RPGs. Oh, you're wrong, baby. That's the obvious. The video first, games are probably. The first, uh, I think for video think, games, are number one. Maybe. What do you think is number one then? I think, RPG video games are RPGs. One. I think video games RPGs are one, too. So I just went with the other one. And I'm going to be wrong again. Well, remember last time I said it was 47%. This time our first answer is 53%. Wow. And that it's RPGs. Is video games. For <laughs> sure. And second, the four-point answer is puzzles. Then role-playing games. So you get some points. Mr. Bonacor. Yeah. Then collectible living card games. No, I'm sorry. No, then miniature games, then collectible card games, and painting and building miniatures comes in last. Okay. So our score now is the people have 15, Bonacor has four, and Garcia has four. So even if we combine our strengths like Voltron, yeah. we still can't take the people yeah. down. Well, That's it right. depends on how well you do on this final question. Let's go back to the very beginning with animals. Let's do the opposite. 
Which of these would you most want to own as a pet if it was kitten sized? All right. Mosquito, cockroach. No, the same no I got one, right? yeah. Yeah, no, the same ones. That's be perfect. <laughs> I got panda bear, mammoth, rhino, gorilla, brontosaurus, or lion. Panda it... bear, mammoth, rhino, gorilla, brontosaurus. Or lion. If you could own a little one, it was the which... size of a kitten. A kitten is like this big, right? Like my, like in my hand, kind of a kitten. Right? Hey, hey. Right. How what kind of kittens? You know, there's a little small man. No, you that's seen what's your so... little baby hands. No, you see these little kittens. <laughs> size of a kitten. Which one would you want to own? I think these would all be cute kitten size, but everything is cute kitten size. Tom, no. if you were kitten I, size, I, I, even you would no, be cute. I catch a mosquito. No. <laughs> <laughs> they are kitten size mosquito. Oh my word. That would be well, I think really anything, anything you are shrinking is going to be cuter. Yeah. That's yeah. true. That's a right? good way of putting it. Anything you yeah. are growing is more terrifying. I'm saying I should have put Cthulhu on the list. <laughs> yeah. Are a you kidding? Cthulhu? Like a little baby Cthulhu, I'd be like, can you wipe his mind, baby? And he'd be like, just, <laughs> can you imagine? And just like wipe somebody's mind out? Yes. I don't know if you guys ever heard about, read this story, Indian in the Cupboard, where the boy puts plastic stuff and it comes to life. Could you imagine this Cthulhu behind me put into that cupboard? I would. I don't care how small that thing is. I'd be running out the door. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's terrifying. Oh, jeez. All right, that's number one. I. I don't know. All right, who's first? I don't remember. I think it's Bonagor. I said video games first, so yeah. Um, I think that's one. Yeah, it's got to be one. Uh, yeah, that's two. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go with lion, cause they're like kittens anyway. Okay, okay. that's what I, that's what I thought would be two. So I'm kind of ranking them here. There you go. I with, maybe... uh, yeah, my vote right now would be panda for one, because yeah. come on. Yeah. Lion was two. And so I need to settle on the on the three here. Rhinos, kind of leathery. I'm not sure it would be necessarily cute. Gorilla are sort of, you know, top heavy and strong. I'm not sure. Again, mammoth or brontosaurus has to be it. Who would go with baby brontosaurus? Oh, baby brontosaurus. Yeah, I'm going with that. I don't. I would like to see it. Yeah, baby Ooh, brontosaurus. Baby. Because not say, only is it cute and small, but also you're a straight magician for bringing them back. <laughs> yeah. I got to say, if you guys had a round, oh. like the final round for the rest of the game, the people would not have been so clearly winning. Hey, you know hey. what, man? I lo don't make me bust out the flute. Panda Bear was clearly number one. Of course. And then just beating out number three, Brontosaurus, was Lion number two. There then it was go. Mammoth. Then, well, Mammoth and Gorilla actually tied. And then Rhino came in last. Yeah. So our final score, people 15, Mr. Bonacore 8, and Z with 6. All that matters. Congratulations, people, and I beat Garcia. Done. Oh, my God. I don't know. Second place is not a bragging thing, actually. <laughs> yeah, you're the first loser. Yes. All righty. Well, we got a few more segments, folks, and then we'll finish off this show. Hello everyone and welcome back to my board game breakfast segment. I am Anthony here of the Board Game Dads and this is AJ. AJ say hi. hi. We are doing a Board Game Breakfast Favorite Game Friday mashup, a hash omelet of sorts, if you will, for breakfast themes, right? I'm going back and doing all the previous picks for board uh, for Favorite Game Friday that I've never done before. So here we go. Let's get right back to where we left off. Uh, next up here is Favorite Game That Got Me Into The Hobby. That would have to be Pandemic. I think that might be a lot of people's answer for that one. Next is game with a unique theme. I went with Histrio for this game. If you're not familiar, Histrio is a game where you're putting on uh, plays to please the king if he's in a good mood or a bad mood, depending on what kind of mood he's in. Those are the kind of actors you're going to play. Uh, but they're all animals, so it's interesting twist there. And Vampire. after that, we've got favorite grail game. I gotta say, I don't have an answer to this one. There is no game that I'm like dying to get that I can't find anywhere, at least not yet. So maybe that's a good thing. Next up, we've got favorite drafting game. It's got to be Sushi Go. Hi. <laughs> uh, Sushi Go Party, for sure. And after that, we've got favorite games to play at work. 
Oh, actually, I skipped one. Sorry. Amazing Components. I'm going to give a shout out to a, a game that I don't Thank hear too much about you. called Ishtar Gardens of Babylon. It has some really cool looking components, some cool gems and some trees and things like that. And then on to your favorite game to play at work. The only game that I've ever actually brought to work, I think, to play with anyone was Love Letter. So I'm going to go with that. Super easy to teach and really quick. Favorite dexterity game. I don't own too many of these, but I got to say Rhino Hero, I think, is my favorite. I uh, can't wait to play that one with this one when he gets a little bit older. All right, AJ, time for one more. We've got a favorite brain burner. That would be Tapestry. I didn't think I was going to like that game, and I actually liked it a lot. Played it a few times. All right, AJ, that's all we have time for today. Two. Yeah. One. Two, one. AJ sees the countdown there. That means time's up. Say bye-bye. Bye. We'll see you next time, folks. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Maple University and the Dice Tower. So Tarrant, you got something to share. Yes, I, there's been more than once where I've come across a game that basically takes longer to explain than it takes the game to defeat you. And it's always a, a truly demoralizing <laughs> experience. Oh, no. um, I remember we had a game of Eldritch Horror with every expansion, which none of us had played before. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure the explanation exceeded the game for that one. But the one which really springs to mind was Pole Economy. This I haven't is a, played that. This is a game from the late 70s, I think. It's got a board that kind of resembles Monopoly and you go around buying companies and doing various business things. And it's a semi-educational game. And there's a government module where someone is the Prime Minister and you set inflation and it changes all the prices. And then there's a treasury and I think taxes going or certain things go in and out of it. And if that treasury runs out of money, then your country is bankrupt and the game is over. And yeah, I, I took this Ill, uh, to an ill-advised ad, Ill game night. It was, um, I spent probably an interrupted hour of people coming and leaving, trying to explain what was going on. And then we bankrupted the country inside 45 minutes. That's so sad. So and then I went home. <laughs> feel feel disappointed so have you had that similar experience and if you have what game let us know in the comment sections and we are Maple University and also on the Dice Tower see you next time all right folks thanks so much for watching we got all kinds of cool videos coming your way we have later on today I'm going to be doing my top 10 dice placement games I, like I said we're doing a four-way review of X-Men Mutant Insurrection We'll be doing another four-way review, I think, tomorrow. I'm looking at new Funkoverse, including the new Funkoverse Darkwing Duck over the weekend. Z is doing videos. What do you got coming later this week, Z? Oh, gosh. Put me on the spot, why don't you? Uh, so we got the X-Men Insurrection thing. What else have I got? Tom, I forget about these things as soon as I do Top them. 10 list or... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So here we go, Tom, if you're going to do this to me. <laughs> hey, baby. Oh, I got a I'm, bad memory, all right? I might do a so, watch yeah, I've party. Got, um, da, 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 da. Good night. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm doing the wow. I'm revisiting the top, uh, like, look forward to games from of 2020 that we did at the beginning of 2020 or end of 2019. And then I've got, uh, I'm doing Jurassic Brunch is the other one that I'm doing, the follow-up to Jurassic Snack from Katala. <laughs> and... Bonic you got, you got to, yeah, you can't, don't, don't put me on the spot like that. I write this stuff down, I knock it out, and I forget about it. <laughs> All right, folks, well, either way, I might be up watching the Mars, I'll be watching Perseverance land on Mars today. I might do a watch party or something online. We'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, Mars, I like Mars. Mars is cool. Mars is good. <laughs> All righty, folks. Well, oh thanks geez. so much. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> And that's Bodegar, who we thought was retired. So we'll see y'all next time. Until then. Oh, I already did that. that I know what I like. Cut the feed, Roy. We're Cut the done. Feed. Here.